The stories of Sonic the Hedgehog are fairly straightforward once you boil them down to the basics. Heroes versus villains, right versus wrong, good versus evil, yin versus yang. But this theme would never be made more obvious, and at the same time, challenged so fiercely until Sonic Adventure 2, and with the introduction of Shadow the Hedgehog. And before we dive in, just a friendly reminder that subscribing and liking videos goes a very, very long way. Those little clicks help me out tremendously. But that's enough e-begging from me. Let's get into it. Now, Dark Mirror enemies and rivals were nothing new in Sonic's world. Hell, the very creation of Sonic himself was meant to challenge Mario's place on the video game throne. Rivalries were built into the very foundation of this series, and with a hero as radically designed and overpowered as Little Blur Blue, it's not too surprising Robotnik kept chucking metal hedgehogs at the fleshy one, and when those failed, enlisted the help of a red echidna's strength to match Sonic's speed. And while this led to some long-standing fan-favorite characters, after a while, none of them could really keep pace with Sonic. That is until the Hedgehog was stopped dead in his tracks by his dark doppelganger. Shadow was both a character that looked more like Sonic than any of his previous rivals, and yet somehow far more striking in design. And that's thanks to the fact that he was created to rival the freshly redesigned Sonic. He really does look like a Sonic that spent his high school days smoking cigarettes under the bleachers with the other goths instead of being, you know, the track and field team captain. But Shadow doesn't look a lot like the shorter, pudgier Genesis era hedgehog. And yes, I have seen plenty of fan made classic Shadow designs, and a lot of them are great, but he still looks a little out of place compared to the Genesis characters. This was a Sonic rival not tethered to two dimensions and a limited pixel count. Since we had moved on from sprites, that get a little more detailed with Shadow's looks, including Kabuki-inspired red stripes against the black fur and partially raised quills, which I always felt implied some level of power akin to a super form. Kind of like a false Super Saiyan. Not fully transformed, but with abilities beyond your base hedgehog. He also comes with gloves with sneaker lips to match his pair of the sickest light-up sneakers I have ever seen. He also has these rings around his wrist, which, as we would find out later, are actually inhibitor rings. Once he takes these off, they can unleash a lot more of his incredible power. And we could dedicate a whole video on that laundry list of abilities alone, but basically he has some form of manipulation over chaos energy, one very specific ability we will get into in a little bit, but he can form it into spears or energy blasts and that sort of DBZ anime crap. I also notice he has these things over his feet. Does he have little footsies energy as well? All of this does bring Shadow's design together, and I have seen this design dismissed before. When you boil it down to the basics, it really isn't that different from Sonic, but when you look look at the prototype designs, you can understand how quickly you can derail something like this. His older designs are both over-designed and at the same time look way too much like Sonic. There is a genius in this simplicity. His inhibitor rings, his little tufts of chest fur, the splashes of red on his quills, all of it really does come together to create something that is both familiar and strikingly unique at the same time. And while he's not the first new character in the adventure games, this introduction felt like the beginning of a new era for this franchise. And not just because of his design, but also his story. Now, anyone familiar with this hedgehog alien hybrid will know that his backstory is a convoluted one. And if you don't know the character, the fact that I just called him a hedgehog alien hybrid should have clued you in. While we have to talk about Shadow's history for the overall point of this video, I'm going to try not to spend a great deal of time on the games themselves, as we will discuss those in greater detail as we visit those titles on the channel down the road. But regardless, I do need to pay special attention to the first game he appeared in. At the start of the Dark Campaign in SA2, Eggman infiltrates the military organization Gun in search of his grandfather's top secret weapon that was created in their service and then locked away for 50 years in the most elaborate hedgehog cage I've ever seen. That or Andromon's really, really excited to see Robotnik. First mistaking the Black Hedgehog for his longtime nemesis, the, um, th this guy, his name escapes me at the moment, Eggman is surprised to learn that his grandfather's pet hedgehog was actually the secret weapon he had just broken into a military compound for. This is Shadow, and he declares himself to be the ultimate life form. That's right, Grandfather Gerald figured the pinnacle of evolution, science, and power came in the form of a cartoon animal man. Well, Eggie isn't about to question the guy. 
Jedi, the blue variant gives him plenty of trouble as it is, and Shadow goes on to show his worth by making short work of a military mech, and then tells Robotnik to meet him on the Space Colony arc with all seven Chaos Emeralds if he hopes to achieve his goal of, um... What? What's he doing again? Is he taking over the world? Or is he just building a theme park? Can somebody just give him, like, the city clearance to do that already? I mean, did you see his Egyptian base? It's adorable. The guy's got some great ideas. Whatever the case is, Shadow doesn't actually care. While he leaves Eggman thinking he's owed a solid for releasing him like a genie from a lamp, Shadow actually has far darker intentions than he lets on. While Eggman wants to rule the world, Shadow wants it to burn. But that's only one side of the story select. Sonic Adventure 2 is split into two campaigns, but even then, things can get a little bit jumbled in terms of character perspectives. While Shadow is a dark copy of Sonic, his name can take on another meaning, that being one veiled in mystery. Even going into this game knowing you have the ability to play Shadow, no matter which story you start with, you're still not given a clear idea of who this guy is. In the Hero Campaign, Sonic's adventure starts off escaping Gun after being framed for the crimes committed by Shadow. And when the two first meet, Shadow already has a Chaos Emerald within his grasp and shows up the Blue Boy's iconic speed with his Chaos Control. While that technique, like the Emeralds themselves, get a little loosey-goosey in terms of what they actually do, here, Chaos Control basically means using the Chaos Emerald to bend time and space to your whim. Or more bluntly, it's basically teleportation. Shadow is already pretty quick on his own, especially with the sick LA lights, baby! Combining that with Chaos Control, Sonic is dumbfounded and left surrounded by gun reinforcements. You start off Sonic's story with him already trailing behind Shadow. The first level ends with Sonic looking like a punk and then thrown in jail, with Shadow casually playing around with a very well-established source of unlimited power. Even if you start off with a dark campaign and then hop over to City Escape just a couple levels in, the only extra knowledge you have is that Shadow is collecting the Chaos Emeralds for a sinister purpose, and he already has one of them collected before Sonic even knows what's going on. This is not a robot attempting to emulate Sonic. This is not a hard-hitting chump who's been duped by Robotnik. Shadow not only matches Sonic's abilities, but he surpasses them, and apparently has been kicking around for at least 50 years, well before Sonic was even born. It's kind of nuts. This is the first time we ever get to play Eggman, the guy who has threatened the world so many times over, but even he is completely oblivious to the danger he has unleashed upon the world. This is the first rival of Sonic's who isn't playing into Eggman's schemes. Eggman's playing into Shadow's, and he plays plays those cards close to his chest, and while he seems a little full of himself, he sure as hell isn't bluffing when he calls himself the ultimate life form. A shadow is not only a dark version of Sonic, but also potentially the most dangerous enemy he has yet faced, capable of cruelty not even thought of by the egomaniacal Eggman. At least, that's what it seems like at first, because that's what Shadow wants the world to see. That's what he wants to believe. And even with the perspective of six different characters, one of them even being Shadow himself, that grim face he puts on seems unwavering. He is determined to see his plan through. And yet, as the game carries on, and we stare deeper into that darkness, every now and then, flickers of light seem to appear. Shadow goes back and rescues Rouge after she gets trapped in a facility set to explode, telling himself and Rouge he only did it for the Chaos Emeralds. But he also gets flashes of this terrifying marionette of a girl. Seriously, this character model looked like it'd be at home on a Goosebumps book. But believe it or not, this is Shadow's closest friend. This is Maria Robotnik the niece of Gerald Robotnik. And as we would discover, Shadow's driving force through this game. Shadow was not born, he was created. And whether or not that was made for the benefit of mankind or made to flat out destroy mankind, he was ultimately a tool for a specific purpose. And Shadow's memory on all of it is fuzzy. But what he knows to be true, regardless of anything else, was his friendship with Maria. Shadow was born on a space station, literally disconnected from the rest of the world. It's really no surprise he sees himself above the people of this planet because he literally was, and he was also probably told time again that he was the ultimate life form. But Maria didn't treat him like a weapon, or a tool, or some sort of creation above all others. She treated him like a friend. She was sweet, innocent, and compassionate. And that compassion resonated with Shadow. She was a light in a dark, empty void. 
but that light would ultimately be snuffed out when Gunn raided the Space Colony Ark, taking out everybody on board, including Maria, who was shot down before Shadow's eyes. And with one last wish, Maria jettisons Shadow to safety in an escape pod before she succumbs to her wounds. Now, a lot of retconning and extra fluff would be added to these events in a future game, but we had none of that in Sonic Adventure 2, so let's not focus on that other stuff just yet. As we begin to explore Shadow's darkness, we begin to understand what defines it. Where there was once compassion, now only stews vengeance and hatred. Even with all that pain, all of that fury, Shadow remains cool and collected. Instead of focusing on sorrow, he instead focuses on a plan to take down the stupid, simple creatures that took away his beloved Maria. And yet, we still see hints of that compassion seep through when he saves Rouge. He might dismiss it as only concern for the Chaos Emeralds, and he might not even realize it himself, going so far as to flat out deny it. But while Shadow might be driven by revenge in his own twisted way, he's still ultimately driven by love. And honestly, and in his own weird way, there might be nobody in this silly franchise who loves as deeply as Shadow the Hedgehog. Even though 50 years have passed since her death, Shadow will make the entirety of humanity pay for what they did to her. He's kind of like a cat. Yeah, they can be total jerks, but if it's your cat, that's your cat. And you are their human. It will love you over any other living thing, and it'll make sure you know it. Once you beat the hero story and the dark story, you unlock a third secret campaign, the last story. In it, we discover that Gerald was driven mad by grief for the death of his niece and set a plan in motion to make sure the world paid for what happened to her. Eggman, seeing his grandfather's zany plan going well beyond anything he was capable of, teams up with Sonic and his friends to stop the Ark from crashing into the planet and creating an extinction level event. Dark or hero, everybody's working together. Except for Shadow. I mean, he's the one who set all of this in motion. What's it matter to him if the space station takes him out with the rest of the planet? He will have fulfilled his purpose, this twisted promise to Maria to end all human life. That is, until Amy Rose happens upon the self-proclaimed ultimate life form. Amy had been unceremoniously removed as a playable character going into the sequel, and often gets poked fun at by fans for mistaking Shadow for Sonic when she first encountered him. But I don't think enough is said about their second encounter, especially since Sora, but somehow worse, took her place in the anime retelling. Even though Shadow has been fighting Sonic and his friends this whole time, this girl, this die-hard Sonic fan and self-proclaimed future wife of the Hedgehog, walks right up to the Black Hedgehog, but this time, there is no mistaking Shadow. She knows who he is and what he is capable of, but she doesn't approach him out of fear or anger. She doesn't blame him for starting this whole mess. She instead asks him to help. She asks him to save the world. And maybe it was out of desperation, but Amy has shown before that she can reach the heart of a literal robot. She's a compassionate gal, and Shadow feels that very thing that he hadn't felt in over 50 years. That compassion. It's barely a moment, but this dam that Shadow had built to hold back his raging river of emotions overflows just the slightest amount and lets a tear escape. There's something to be said for protagonists like Joel from Last of Us. Uh, spoilers for Last of Us. You just come after her. There has been so much debate over the choice he makes at the end of that game. Is he good? Is he evil? What does it mean to love someone so deeply that you would let the world crumble around you just to ensure their well-being? That choice and this character is so interesting and I love the endless conversations that Joel seems to spark because I'm sure a lot of us can relate. Maybe it is selfish, maybe it isn't good for the whole of humanity or even your community, but when you love someone that deeply, there isn't anything you wouldn't do for them. But Shadow had lost Maria. He has lost the only connection he had to humanity. He's more than willing to burn the entire world as an effigy in her honor, and he certainly has the capability to do it. He has seen his goal through to the end, and all he needs to do now is just sit back and watch it all burn. But just the slightest bit of compassion reminds him what Maria was all about, endlessly optimistic and hopeful. Would his closest friend, the one who showed him so much love, really ask Shadow to make the world pay? No, of course not. It's one thing to rain down hell in the name of someone you love, 
but it takes a whole other level of strength to let go of your hatred and carry on in respect to what they truly wanted, no matter how much it hurts. And despite some stupid retcons or how easy it is to joke about Shadow going on a warpath over what basically amounts to misinterpreting a text message missing a couple of key words, Duck you, autocorrect! Back in 2001, I saw this as Shadow accepting that he remembered what he wanted to remember to justify his revenge. And despite all of his boastful claims to being the ULF, he has to carry a lot of hatred for himself. The ultimate life form, unable to protect this one fragile life of the person he loved more than anything else in the world. In his short time on the planet below, he meets a hedgehog almost identical to him. And despite all their clashes, despite framing the guy for his crimes, despite showing him up with chaos control and watching him get jettisoned off into space like he had been half a century ago, except this time with more explosive results, Sonic keeps coming back. And he never once loses that stupid smirk. He never stops going forward. It didn't matter how far ahead Shadow was at the start of their race. Sonic caught up, and at this rate, may even lap him, all because he opened his heart, and relies on and trusts his friends. As the game carried on, Shadow went from seeing Sonic as beneath him, and then to his equal, and then maybe even his better, all the while probably seeing a little of himself in Sonic, as a happier hedgehog, one with friends, like a little pink hedgehog that's now asking him for help reminding him who Maria truly was and why she mattered so much to him to begin with. It's been building up this entire time without him even realizing it, but this final plea is the last little bit of incentive Shadow needs to decide who he wants to be and come face to face with his past, his rage, and his darkness. And I mean that quite literally. In one last line of defense to make sure Gerald's plan of revenge is seen through, the Bio Lizard is unleashed. This, believe it or not, is the prototype for the ultimate life form. Yeah, before they landed on this sleek hedgehog package, they first went with something a little more kaiju-y. Like perfect chaos before the big bad bio lizard, this beast represents the ugliness of uncontrolled chaos. Violent, blind rage that destroys everything in its path. This is the monster Shadow has been battling within himself this entire time, and it is hell-bent on destroying the planet below. Even when seemingly subdued by Shadow, it goes and uses the Hedgehog's own chaos control to warp in front of the Ark and then merge with its cannon to guide it towards the planet's surface. It's not doing this for Maria. It's not doing this for Gerald. It's just a mindless monster programmed for destruction. But even when all seems hopeless, this monster was, ultimately, just a prototype, a failure. Shadow is the final design, the ultimate design. And he's different, not just aesthetically, but he is sentient. He has free will. He has a choice. Shadow has now faced off against two beings that represent those choices, his path into darkness and his path as a hero. And it's here, with the help of Sonic, his friends, and the seven Chaos Emeralds, where Shadow becomes who he was always meant to be. Where there was only flickers of light before, now stands a blinding beacon of hope. This is Super Shadow. And that's why I had to go through all of the game before even mentioning the glow-in-the-dark variant. In the Genesis games, a lot of us were left to interpret a lot of what could not be said. But the adventure games state their themes loud and clear. I mean that quite literally, thanks to Crush 40. There is no mistaking what Super Shadow represents. This transformation did not happen in this one brief, brilliant flash of light. It's been happening through this entire story. At the start of the game, Amy, the girl who loves Sonic more than anything, and Eggman, the guy who hates Sonic more than anything, couldn't tell the difference between Sonic and Shadow. And by the end of the journey, neither can the game itself. 
In this amazing finale, Super Shadow teams up with Super Sonic to take down this ugly mass of lasers and tumors, but attacking it isn't enough to stop the arc's trajectory. So, with Sonic, Shadow unleashes his iconic move, Chaos Control, on the entirety of the Space Colony. This move that showed up Sonic's speed at the start of the game ultimately would cost Shadow his life. But as he falls backwards to the planet below, he is at peace, knowing his promise to Maria would ultimately be fulfilled, undoing all his mistakes made by both him and her grandfather, and knowing that he is leaving the world in the hands of the hedgehog who did survive the battle, the hedgehog who showed him a better way, the actual ultimate life form. And as Sonic returned to the Ark, we see something we have never seen in a Sonic game before. Longtime enemies standing side by side, united. The loner, Shadow, has brought these two sides together. And they remember the Black Hedgehog not as a villain, not as a faker, but as a hero. That is until he was found alive in the very next game and then got a terrible spin-off that was just his journey in Sonic Adventure 2 again, but... <sighs> worse. I am Shadow Android, the ultimate life form, a copy of Shadow the Hedgehog. What? How do you strip a Sonic Adventure style game down to just one character, basically tell his story over again, and then this somehow ends up being the more bloated game of the two? Yeah, so Shadow's ultimate sacrifice ended up being a moot point, and his popularity would guide us into the dark age of the franchise. And I'm not about to deep dive the other games just yet. We'd be here all day. That said, as bad as a spin-off game or Sonic 06 got, they're not without their bright spots. While his title game story is redundant, Abundant, contradictory, and flat out dumb. What? The overall point was understanding that our choices have consequences. Our lives can go in so many different directions, and it's up to us to make the right calls. And despite all the endings provided by the game, there is only one that is considered canon. Shadow must once again confront his past and save the planet from a giant mass hovering right above it. And yes, once again, Super Shadow only appears once a decisive choice is made about who Shadow is. But this time, there is no Sonic to help him teleport away this massive clump. Shadow must do this all on his own, and this time, he survives but he must also survive in a world without the reliance on his past. No more plans to uncover who he is. Shadow must carry on while carrying the memories of those lost loved ones, but going forward, he will no longer let them haunt them. When I first played Sonic Adventure 2 way back in the day, just taking all of this at face value and not really understanding the deeper emotional resonance I was making with this character, I had a very specific nitpick about Shadow's transformation, and I think that's partially from my own initial expectations of what I expected Shadow to ultimately be. As cliche as Shadow's arc ended up being, keep in mind that villain introductions, even in the series, can end up going very, very badly. And my initial ideas going into this game when I was much younger, I kind of assumed that Shadow would end up remaining a villain through the entire title, and anticipated that we would get a dark Super Shadow to face off against Sonic's super form. Like I said already, when I first saw Shadow's raised quills, I took that to mean some kind of false super form, and I thought that a transformation would continue the theme of darkness. It's got a dark campaign, the guy's named Shadow? Why not continue the motif by giving Shadow all that negative energy while Sonic got all the positive Positive, as that had been established just one game prior. Little did I know that dark form would actually appear in Shadow's Shadow. That leads us to the third and final appearance of Shadow's super form in the games, and Shadow's confrontation with it. Despite the train wreck that is Sonic 06, it's here that we get a fitting conclusion to Shadow's story. He had dealt with the past, and even though he had sacrificed himself, the universe was not going to let him go that easily and forced him to deal with the present. But now, he was confronted by the future. Like a shown-in Christmas carol. Merry Christmas, sir! Screw Christmas. Shadow learns that ultimately, humanity will turn on him, and his friend, oh I'm sorry Sega, I just meant co-worker, we're not allowed to have relations in the office, Omega, would be programmed by the humans to take the Dark Hedgehog down. All of this is shown by the main antagonist of Shadow's story, Mephiles the Dark. 
who took on Shadow's form, and soon after, takes on that dark transformation I had always wanted from Adventure 2. But despite literally seeing his fate right before him, Shadow remains undeterred. As we have already seen twice over now, Shadow has made his choice. It's up to the rest of the world to make theirs. He knows who he is, and it's not this extra crispy super hog. Nephiles gets his ass handed to him in the past, present, and future. And when he finally reveals his true form, so does Shadow. Super Shadow once again shows us who the character truly is once you get below that moody, stoic surface. Now, I know that Super Shadow has appeared both in Sonic X and the Archie comics, but we only have so much time here today. And if you can't tell by now, I'm more interested in the themes that Super Shadow represents as opposed to the feats he's accomplished. But for the sake of it, because I know it will be brought up, Super Shadow can do a lot of his base form's zany abilities on a whole other level. And again, it's important to note that while Chaos Control at the end of Adventure 2 knocked him on his ass, and it was originally intended to be his death, he did ultimately survive and would come back to redo a similar feat without breaking a sweat, meaning that Super Shadow can get stronger. And also, I guess, like, if he puts his hand together, he can shoot little lasers and stuff. That's pretty special. And while we're on it, let's briefly discuss Super Shadow versus other super characters. Now, some of you may not count Mephiles as a super form, but but base Shadow can kick his ass, so Super Shadow would have no problem against this form of Mephiles. And I would also bet that Super Shadow could handily take down Dark Super Sonic. I'm not gonna bother explaining how all that went down, and honestly, we really don't know what he is capable of since he showed up so briefly in Sonic X, but I have seen a lot of fans theorize that Dark Sonic could potentially wreck Shadow's whole world. And while fan animated fights are fun, I don't agree. As I've laid out through this entire video, Super Shadow really only appeared when Shadow has come to terms with who he is. And as important as that light is, representing the heroic heart of the Hedgehog, that dark side is still there as well. You might have caught it at the beginning of this episode when I said Yin versus Yang, but anyone familiar with that phrase understands that's not how it's said. It's Yin and Yang. Light and darkness cannot exist without the other. Shadow has embraced both the light and the dark, and he is a more complete person because of this. I mean, this is Riku's whole shtick in Kingdom Hearts. You weebs know this crap already. Shadow has endured the pain of loss and the desire for revenge. And despite all of this, ultimately, he uses his power to better the world around him. He can glow as bright as the sun, but understands the cool comfort of stepping out of the light and into the shadows. He does not fear the dark, nor is he blinded by the light and that comes from a lifetime of love and loss. He knows better than anyone that you have to... <sighs> yep, that, that thing. Sonic, on the other hand, saw a side character and Diet Sora get hurt. And mixed with some bad emeralds, he loses his shit for a minute. Yeah, all right, he tears through some robots, no problem. Uh, neat. It's a cool design, but I'm sorry, guys. In my opinion, Super Shadow would beat the living crap out of this form of Sonic. Dark Sonic does not have more power just because he's in a bad mood. And if he's lashing out against Super Shadow, the hedgehog who has endured way more pain and has learned to control it? No, man, I'm sorry. There, there's no chance. Eggman snaps Sonic out of this grumpy form by reminding him that Shadow already has the moody hog roll covered, and he's not looking to retire. You do your thing. Let him do his. He, he knows what he's doing. You're just going to embarrass yourself. You got to remember, every time the hedgehogs show up in the adventure games, it's showing you the difference between that chaos energy in a chaotic, uncontrolled fashion, as opposed to a refined, focused power. The bad guys don't win in Sonic's universe, and Sonic snaps out of that because he knows that's not the way these things go. So yeah, you put Dark Sonic up against a Super Shadow who has his shit together? Nah, man, that's, that's not a fight at all. It'd be cool for a minute, but our creamy boys got this. Shadow is a divisive character, to put it mildly. To many, he was something akin to Venom, a striking contrast to our hero with a powerfully memorable entrance. But afterwards, once we got over the Dark Mirror shtick, we just middled around with mediocre Drek, only kept around thanks to being popular and having a cool design. But 
Also like Venom, to many, there was so much more below that inky black surface. And that's certainly the case for Shadow. Because while he has his detractors, his fans will tell you that some of the greatest narratives ever produced in the series revolve around the ultimate life form. Yeah, maybe he'd be remembered better if he just stayed in his one game. And I'll be honest, I've always been of the opinion the story could have been told a little bit better. And like my homie Josh from Geek Critique has already pointed out, maybe could have used a little more association with Sonic himself. I know there are theories out there, and we will explore some of those fun ideas and some of my own in another video, but not the point of today's episode. We're focusing on what they did give us, and I don't hate what we got. Because regardless of anything else, Shadow's story did resonate with a whole generation of fans, and his future appearances did as well. And look, I know that some of the choices in recent years Sega have taken with Shadow have made fans understandably upset. He's a little less Sasuke and a little more Vegeta. You know who those characters are, don't lie to me, you've sat through this whole video, you've seen- <sighs> I've been able to wave off Shadow's recent appearances for one excuse or the other. Maybe it's a spin-off series and it doesn't matter. Maybe he's just a little bit too competitive when he's around Sonic. And maybe he's just not perfect and sometimes regresses into a more violent, scowly boy. Or maybe because Sega wants to make this character nothing more than Sonic's angry rival, and having him go through a journey of self-discovery undermines that whole idea. Okay, yeah, it's, it's, it's probably that last thing. Regardless, I still love this character. Because no matter how angry Sega tries to make him out to be, I know deep down that Shadow was probably the one that spent more time in the Chow Garden than any other character in Adventure 2. I mean, his Funko has that variant for a reason. The ultimate life form has raised the ultimate cutie pie. Scowl all you want, because deep down, we know that there glows the light of a hero. And that's thanks to his introduction in Adventure 2. Shadow's story is presented as one of revenge, only to reveal itself as a tale of redemption. And that redemption manifested itself in Super Shadow. His transformation matters because it shows us, regardless of the path you take in life, even if you haven't been as confident in who you are, like some of your contemporaries, even if so much of your life has been defined by pain and loss, and even if you've made mistakes or regrettable choices, regardless, no matter the path you have taken so far, there is still the potential for you to become something truly incredible. The potential to do good for yourself and those around you, and all it really takes is making a simple choice. Sayonara, Shadow Warriors. Well, that brings us to the end of the video. Script is done, so if you're just here for Shadow, I thank you for sticking around, and if you want to subscribe because you want to hear more from me, I would greatly appreciate it. But whether you were here at the very beginning, that first Sonic video over three years ago, or you just subscribed today, every single person that you're seeing listed in that subscriber count they mean a whole lot to me. Around this time last year, I had a subscriber count of about 1,500 people. And even then, that was more of an audience than any of my creativity has ever managed to draw. And now I'm sitting here creating a video celebrating the 50,000 subscriber milestone. Hell, by the time this comes out, we're going to be near 60,000 subscribers. I might be able to plan for a 100,000 subscriber special. And I got to tell you, before January this year, that was not even a possibility. I was still desperately just making things because I love making things, but really wanting to create for a living. And now that's a reality for me. This is a part-time job for me. And someday it might even be a full-time job. And that wouldn't happen without an audience. That wouldn't happen without your support. And I'm never going to forget that. I'm never going to take that for granted. I, I'm i really just a guy who's gushing about some other people's creations. But you guys enjoy what I do. And truthfully, I've had to re-record this section about five separate times now because I always end up in tears because I still can't believe that's my life right now. Even as a part-time job, I'm creating something that people want to see and experience and I really can't describe in words what that means to me. So thank you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. As you are also seeing on the screen, I asked folks to share their Super Shadow fan art. So if you can do me a service and 
go check it out. I'll try to link where I can. A lot of the stuff was posted in my Discord. Some are in Twitter, but regardless, I'm trying to provide links where I can. So if you got a second, you see a piece that stands out to you, just head on over and let them know you appreciate it, because I promise you that praise means the world to them. And thank you for helping me achieve this goal. Thanks for being part of this goal. Thank you for the support on Patreon. Thank you for commenting, giving me critical feedback or praise. Thank you for the engaging conversations I've had this past year, the friendships. Thank you for appreciating something I'm passionate about. Just thank you guys. What?